They appeared from nowhere, trampled everything in their path, and created the largest land empire in history. With them, they brought mass slaughter, the plague, epic hairstyles, fur caps, tax breaks, religious tolerance, and of course, war machinery that was way ahead of its time. How did they manage to pull it off? It all started on a meadow in the middle of Asia, where nomadic tribes have been at war with each other for centuries, stealing each other's horses and, on occasion, forcing their neighbors to pour money into the construction industry. But then this guy showed up and said, no more screwing around. He led the nomads to conquest and created an empire that would control the area from the Baltic to the Sea of Japan at the end of the 13th century. Genghis abolished the tribal division, mixed up warriors from different tribes, and organized the army according to the decimal system. He also selected the army exclusively by skill and taught the warriors strict discipline. Because of this, the Mongolian army did only what it was ordered to do, unlike other medieval armies that were prone to jerk behavior. The total number of warriors in the horde was estimated at around 120,000, of which two-thirds were archers. By conquering China, the Mongols got access to the ingenious inventions of the Chinese engineers, which enabled them to successfully attack cities. Mongolian warriors traveled between 60 and 100 kilometers a day. Each warrior had at least five horses at his disposal, but not just any horses. Steppe horses are fast and very economical. They eat little and tolerate harsh climatic conditions. They can find food even under a snow cover, which is why the Mongols had no problems with the Russian winter, unlike certain gentlemen. Mobility was decisively influenced by simple nomadic logistics. In addition to horses, the army led a huge number of cattle, sheep, yaks, and camels. Animals used pastures, served for transport, and gave meat and milk. And as the last option in their diet, the nomads used horse blood. The scouts went about 100 kilometers ahead of the armies, which is why the Mongols never entered an ambush. They avoided direct combat and would usually fake a retreat in order to lure the enemy into an ambush. They always encircled the opposing army in open space and used masses of archers to attack in waves. An average warrior could fire six arrows in 10 seconds, which mostly settled battles. During sieges, they used civilians as human shields and launched infected people with catapults, unaware of the existence of Yersinia pestis, the Black Plague, which is why Europe lost most of its population in the 14th century. They didn't go to war before gathering information about the enemy country. That job was entrusted to merchants and spies. A detailed invasion plan would then be developed. The Mongols hadn't heard of Caesar's conquest of Gaul, nor had they read the Chinese philosophy of war. They had their own strategy, which was actually a copy of the Great Hunt. The Great Hunt was an annual event to which all warriors were invited. It lasted for several weeks because hunting groups were arranged in a chain that stretched for kilometers. At a given signal, the ends of the chain began to close the circle around the hunting ground gradually compressing the game into an even smaller space. The Great Hunt taught the Mongols long-distance coordination, which is why they always attacked more than one target. A system of communication between troops made it possible to command armies hundreds of kilometers away. This strategy stretched the enemy's forces, which would then be destroyed. The invasion was necessarily accompanied by violence that served to cause fear and panic. In March of 1242, the Horde suddenly left Central Europe and retreated to the east. The cause was long speculated, until someone got the idea to overlap these two maps. And then everything became clear. Primitive logistics tied the Mongolian armies to the steppe belt. At the beginning of the 13th century, there were favorable climate changes that enabled them to reach Europe. But the winter of 1242 transformed the Pannonian Plain into a large swamp that prevented Batu Khan from continuing his march to the Atlantic. However, the Great Withdrawal didn't save Europe from marauding incursions and the constant danger of a new invasion. This state lasted almost a whole century. The Mongolian way of warfare fell into oblivion, only to be rediscovered in the 20th century 
when Sabutai's ideas got pampered by a Soviet marshal called Tuachevsky, who wrote the theory of modern warfare. It was, in fact, so modern that he ended up with a bullet in the back of his head. However, his ideas quickly became relevant due to problems in the neighborhood where a group of Prussian veterans extensively tested their version of modern warfare on the Poles and the French. They tried to do the same thing on the Soviets, but four years later, it turned out that Sobotai's modified tactics still worked better. When he led the nomads to conquer the world eight centuries ago, Genghis couldn't have known that he would inspire entire generations of warlike rogues. And that's why the Steppe Horseman will forever remain a symbol of military superiority regardless of the fact that, today, we mostly shoot rockets and other expensive toys. Hey, I'm M from Imperium Populorum. Thank you for watching our video. If you liked it, make sure to like and subscribe. And before you go, watch this video next.